When I think about the word diet, I think about how much and what I'm consuming of something, and ultimately, what habits I have to put into place to see changes I desire. Sometimes these goals and changes are sustained, and other times they were not. But either way, it comes down to what I consume on a daily basis. Food isn't the only thing that we consume. We also consume information. Over the course of the year, the world and this country have faced enormous social, political, and economic events. I think it's a fair assertion in general that people are struggling to see the connections between things, how to make sense of everything, and what is the big picture. That being said, does the way that we consume information today create a narrowness in how we see things? What are the consequences of when we read headlines and not articles? What happens when we opt for the Facebook post as opposed to analyzing an op-ed in the newspaper? What are the ramifications of the biased platforms of cable news or how we're taking in our information 140 characters at a time via Twitter? All of us have an understanding that if we continually consume a diet of highly processed food, it'll lead to bad health. Maybe it's time to treat the information we consume in the same way. How do we help our students manage the fast food world of information that they live in? My approach to this challenge has evolved over time. Over the past few years, I've shifted many of my pedagogical practices to mirror the changes New York has made to its social studies curriculum. The shift has been encompassed by a move away from drill and kill content to historical thinking skills. Thematic essays, DBQs, and standard multiple choice questions are all gone. And in their place are stimulus-based questions, constructive response questions, or CRQs, and enduring issues essays. When we made these changes in New York, I was all in. I was excited about what our classroom could become and the new role that I would play in it. I was ready to drop being the deliverer of content and shift to this new skill-based learning. The questions being asked in class now felt so much more relevant and far less redundant. Could students understand historical and geographical context? Could they really analyze the reliability of information beyond trusting sources as primary and secondary? Audience, point of view, bias, purpose would also now be part of our new vocabulary. I saw this as a gateway to students making better claims, better arguments, and that they would be utilizing information in a more authentic way. And ultimately, it was my hope that when they encountered information outside of class, they would have the skill set to consume it in a more healthy way. My process started in the 2018-19 school year. I got to work right away editing, designing, revamping materials. While some classrooms use Sprite or Happy as acronyms for students to analyze documents, I came up with my own. Crap. Context, reliability, audience, point of view, and purpose. My students latched onto this idea and a poop emoji pillow showed up one day from a student. A poster followed and a student brought in poop emoji stress balls. Why? Because we had a lot of crap to work on and prep for the new state exam. Now, I'm not sure how you feel about crap, but my students bought in on the lowbrow toilet humor and were ready to work. But as we got out of the gates to the start of the new school year, the struggle was immediate and the struggle was real. Framing what historical context is took time, teaching that all primary sources are not reliable because of things like bias and purpose blew their minds. It was as though they had been trained that all primary sources are reliable. Eventually we started to break through, but it felt like I was literally reprogramming their brains. By November, things began to settle in, and some of my students were starting to get it. In class, students would answer specific questions based on analysis and then apply that information to extended writing prompts. For example, students analyzed a letter from Gandhi to Lord Irwin from March 1930. Almost all of my students answered the document questions very well, but there was a spectrum of success when it had come to the writing prompt. Some were really good and included historical context. Some discussed why he had the point of view he did, but others missed the mark and I wasn't happy about it. Why did some students get it and others didn't? I immersed myself in reflective practice. We edited those responses. I retaught key pieces. I modeled strong arguments with evidence, but still I felt we were behind the curve. That is until I noticed that some of my students, those that were excelling, 
were annotating the documents that I was assigning. They were going much further than the simple highlighting techniques that I was teaching. Where did this come from? I inquired and some of my students simply said, oh, Mrs. Waterman teaches us how to annotate documents in English class. The revelation was as if after months and months of putting together a jigsaw puzzle, someone had just handed me the box and I could now see the cover and what it is I was putting together. Fast forward through some incredible collaboration with Diane Waterman, an AP English teacher in our high school, where she brought me up to speed with this method methodology she was using by showing me a rubric that I could use with my students that would also show them how to annotate documents as well. I had an idea of what I needed to do in class, but it was her brilliance and willingness to share that gave me the vision that I have today. Implementation of the rubric and technique went well because the majority of students were familiar with it from English class. Prior to this, I was teaching students to highlight and to identify key information. This annotation rubric and guide really turned into more of a dissection of a text where students have to dig deep, make notes, and provide explanations of things as they go. This process is far superior to what I was doing before, which now feels entirely inadequate. The rest of the school year really fell into place. Student responses, arguments, claims, and document analysis all improved, and 100% of students received the credit they needed on the first administration of the new Regents exam that June. Looking at the actual process, I've always started out with modeling what proper annotations look like and why. At an expert level, students should use a variety of annotations when marking their text. They should be used precisely and assist students in making strong evidence. Marginal notes should also be used to clarify the importance of the annotation. I want students to be able to identify key points, show their thinking, and determine things like a central idea, purpose, rhetoric, or bias. Students should also mark up their text with any historical or geographical context that they think would support the document as well. The rubric allows me to score them at levels of expert, apprentice, novice, and also give them feedback on how they utilize their annotations and apply them to larger objectives such as writing prompts. When given a text to annotate, students start off with making a key to follow right on the actual document. I believe they should start by boxing unfamiliar words and highlighting ideas that they think are important. Multiple reads of the document could be required for them to include other markings such as stars for repeating ideas and question marks for things they're unsure about. There are several others for them to consider, such as drawing arrows to related ideas throughout the text, all of which serve the purpose of helping the student understand. Yes, this takes time, but I see it as I'm changing their diets, building new habits, and how they consume information. Students have bought into this process and appreciate how this skill set now overlaps in English and social studies class in an authentic way. Reading longer text seems less laborious to students and many of them have expressed that yes, in fact, it does take longer, but it has helped them understand what they're doing and why. Students have also expressed that when they went back and looked at old work, maybe a few weeks later or even months later, it was much easier because they were using their own work and remembered that process. This was an awesome shift in my classroom because what was done in November still had usefulness and utility in May. This process was the missing link in my classroom when I started asking these questions for the first time, contextualization, reliability, bias, point of view. Ultimately, I love how it's helped my students become better writers that they now support their claims and their arguments in a much richer way, regardless if it's responding to a low-risk writing prompt or more of a formal assessment piece. I truly believe that this technique allows for a tremendous versatility in how it can be used by teachers in class, but here are two quick examples. Let's start with Gandhi's letter to Lord Irwin in 1930. If you look at this student's responses to the pre-written questions, you can see that they had no issues answering these questions that assess their understanding of key points from the text. But it's this student's annotations where they highlighted and starred those ideas and made marginal notes that forced them to apply their understanding of what they were doing. 
I love here at the bottom where they explain the importance of salt and provide the context of what Gandhi was talking about. Students then had to take this information and connect it to the writing prompt of how did Gandhi's methods bring about change to India? A prompt like this is something that I use in my classroom weekly and consider it low risk with more of an emphasis put on the process of the skills and the application. A formal example of the annotation process comes from our Enduring Issues essay here in New York. As you look at this essay prompt, an enduring issue is a challenge or a problem that people have faced across time. People have attempted to address them with varying degrees of success. Essentially what students have to do using five documents is to identify an issue that has impacted people in an enduring way. They must use three of the five documents and show that it has been long lasting. Very clearly, the challenge here for them is to identify, define, and argue their claim using evidence from the text. None of the documents have scaffolded questions like a DBQ and contain minimal historical or geographical context. If students did not have the ability to dissect and break these documents down using the annotation process, I'm not sure how they would achieve the outlined objectives of the assessment. When we look at the documents, the first comes from Great Britain in the 19th century. The second is about growing industry in India in the 1900s. The third is about George Soros in labor and capital. The fourth is about child labor in the 21st century. And the last is about the recycling of electronics in 2012. On the surface, this can be a daunting task of making an argument and supporting it with evidence. But annotating and breaking them down allows students to unlock the information they need to make connections. Looking at document one, the student's understanding is enhanced so much by the techniques, the marginal notes, explanations, callbacks, context that they identify is going to allow them to see where this document might fit in with the others. Perhaps their argument will be about cheap labor or the impact of globalization. Maybe they'll discuss the impact of trade and capitalism on the world. After completing the process for document one, students will have to repeat this process for the other corresponding documents. As they dissect and dig into document two, what connections will they find that they can trace back to the previous document? Or when they move forward into the more recent events, what evidence will they use from document one or two to make connections to show that this issue has endured over time? Whatever they choose, it will be the evidence they unlock, coupled with outside information they can recall, that will allow them to make their argument and support it. So when it comes down to it, I believe in this process, and it has fundamentally changed so much about what I do in the classroom. I'm a firm believer that this process works and gives students the tools that they need to build better arguments with evidence because it shows them how to unlock it and to utilize it in their writing process. Is it easy? No. But neither is choosing a kale salad over the value meal of burgers and fries. That being said, this is our challenge as teachers, to help students develop the tools and skills they need to feel more comfortable in this process. So when they do have to choose how and what information they're consuming, hopefully they'll do it in a healthy way that will last far beyond their time in social studies class. Thank you.